Early on the morning of July 23, 2009, hundreds of agents of the FBI and the IRS's Criminal Investigation Division fanned out across New Jersey and New York, arresting scores of public officials, political operators, rabbis, and others in connection with the largest federal sting and corruption case ever in our state's notorious history. Among those taken into custody that morning, as we know, was, was the mayor of this city, Peter Camerano, a number of leading officials from elsewhere right here in Hudson County, including the Jersey City Council President, Mariano Vega, and the Deputy Mayor of Jersey City, Leona Baldini, along with mayors of nearby Ridgefield in Bergen County, and Secaucus, uh, just a really spitting distance away, uh, Assemblyman Harvey Smith, Assemblyman Dan Van Pelt, and political and community operators whom we've all come to know in some way or another, people like Jack Shaw, Ed Cheatham, and Joe Cardwell. Guilty pleas and convictions followed quickly for some, but through it all, the case remained oddly mysterious. I worked on the research and reporting process that became the Jersey Stint. On March 15th, Ted and I released the Jersey Sting. We are proud to say the book has uh, made it to a bestseller list, the indie bound, uh, the independent bookseller's bestseller list. We think the people here in Hoboken had a lot to do with that. Thank you very much. We also know, as I, as I referenced earlier on, that the book has taken on something of, a, of its own persona here in Hoboken uh, in connection with the ongoing political campaign. And frankly, there's, there's no greater compliment for a reporter than for people to care about your work, to take it seriously, and then for it to have an effect. We had gotten um, some word the day before that something big was coming down involving corruption. I'm, I'm getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The, the, you know, 10, 15, 20 people, and it, it didn't stop. Um, at one point, we get word from somebody that, that not only were there rabbis involved, but there was somebody selling human body organs. And Josh turns to me and goes, nah, there's, there's no possible way that's true. Somebody's smoking crap. Mm -hmm. But it was true. <laughs> it was, it, that, I, you know, at that point, we, we knew we had gotten, we had figured out that that was a guy by the name of Solomon Dweck. Solomon Dweck was, it turned out, had been arrested in uh, uh, three years earlier down in, um, in uh, uh, Deal. His father, he was, he was the uh, son of a very prominent rabbi. He owned a, a real estate business. He had a, a uh, very large real estate empire. And he, he got caught one day trying to pass a $25 million check at a bank drive-in window. Still didn't think that anything was wrong because Solomon had been moving money in and, in and out of the bank like this for years. And they thought, well, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's a cash flow issue. He'll, he'll make good on it. But uh, unbeknownst to anybody, including us at the time, uh, by, by, by the date of this, this uh, sting operation, he had been running a multi-million dollar Ponzi operation and, and when he was arrested, um, the Ponzi scheme had come to an end. He had gotten no more investors, and he had, he had loans coming due, and, and so he went to the bank and he took out some money. Three weeks later, the FBI came uh, knocking on the door, arrested him, and thus began the Jersey State. Solomon Dweck became a cooperator for the government. He began, um, he, he was looking at 30 years in prison for his role in, in the bank fraud. And um, he didn't want to do 30 years. He's got, he's got five kids. He had four kids, one on the way. Um, and his lawyer went to then U.S. Attorney Chris Christie and said, let's make a deal. Chris Christie did not want to make a deal because Solomon Dweck was facing 30 years in prison. It was, it was a home run, you know, declare victory, uh, take the pictures at the press conference and go home. Um, but, but Solomon Dweck had a very convincing attorney 
by the name of Mike Himmel. Mike Himmel was a former U deputy assistant U.S. attorney himself. And he, he uh, told him that, that Solomon could make a lot of cases for him. And after due consideration, they decided to try him out. And uh, he began working for the government. And for uh, the longest time, this case, the Jersey State, had nothing to do with politics. It had nothing to do with Hoboken, nothing to do with Jersey City. It had to do with money laundering. Solomon Dweck, while he was running his Ponzi scheme, was involved in a, a very simple um, tax scam down in Deal. What he was doing was he was, he was uh, helping people in his community launder money. He was the head of a yeshiva um, in addition to his real estate business. He would take checks from people who were donating to the yeshiva, and then he would kick back all but 15% of it. The yeshiva would keep 15%. The people who got the kickbacks would be able to, to write off that money on their, real, on their income taxes. And Solomon took a, a cut as well. How much of a cut? After this was all over, Solomon had a plastic bag filled with $1 million in cash. One day, though, he comes in and um, they're, they're trying to find somebody to bridge from money laundering to, to public corruption, and they come across a political operative in Jersey City. who was nothing more than a, a, um, a building inspector. And as things go in Hudson County, he was, he was a great building inspector. He, he failed his plumbing inspection license and couldn't inspect buildings, so they made him a taxi inspector instead. Um, with, with people like this, the government was off and running looking for corrupt politicians. And the building inspector brought them to another Jersey City official who brought them to another operative. And, and all of these operatives helped link the government to politicians in Hudson County. And, and this is what we said in the book. In Hudson County, fixers are the key to getting almost anything done. Reliable middleman is Ralph Mara, Christie's top lieutenant and eventual successor as federal prosecutor, would later describe them on live television. Want a meeting with the mayor? Need a sit down with a congressman or candidate or city council president? You need a guy with the right rep and the right set of phone numbers? Someone who can open doors and decode the political landscape? A political fixer was someone who could tell a developer that money in politics does not signify philosophy but as a necessary business tool, and it's nonpartisan. As one insider explained to Dweck on an FBI wiretape, he needed to take care of both guys, spreading his money between competing political candidates to hedge his bets as he navigated a city government as foreign to him as a third world dictatorship, a stranger in a strange land. We, when we talk about the case, we're really talking mostly, especially here in Hoboken, about the corruption side, but, and I'm gonna talk about that now, but the you know, obviously it has 15 or, or 17 defendants, bad guys, on the money laundering side, and they are completely disconnected from Hoboken, from the political corruption case, uh, with the exception of one, and, and that's what I'm going to close with. But we learned as, as we progressed quickly that the seeds for this case were sown decades ago, long before Solomon Dweck was born long before many of you lived in Hoboken, and as a, as a transplant here in New Jersey, long before any of us ever heard of Hoboken. The, it's important to remember that Hudson County and Newark's long history of corruption and patronage has led over the decades to a number of different reform movements. One of them, almost 100 years ago, led to the idea that's actually been adopted throughout the country in many big cities, that we need to take partisan politics out of our local municipal elections. The idea being municipal services are too important, schools are too important, garbage collection is not a Republican or Democratic issue, patronage can only damage local services. Let's leave partisan politics to Congress to the state legislatures and the governorship, to the presidency. But locally, 
Let's make sure people have options because the problem is, as you know in Hoboken, if you had partisan elections, you would end up having no one besides the Democrat winning ever. Every reform will have unintended consequences that are almost invariably negative. The negative ad effect of nonpartisan spring elections and having no political organization is it becomes a free-for-all. When you take a free-for-all atmosphere where you have no structured organizations involved and you overlay that with the cost of running elections in a place like Hoboken where you are dependent on purchasing time and other kinds of media from the most expensive media market in the world being New York City, you end up having an incredible need for money. And at the root of Mayor Camerano's crimes was his need for campaign cash. That's not to in any way offer a defense. His attorneys offered that defense. I'm only saying that we don't have a guy like Mayor Barnes and Patterson. There's no, there's no running off to Brazil for Brazilian hookers. He needed the money to win his election. He had, as you know better than us, he had a, a tooth and nail May election. He was fortunate to beat expectations and get into a runoff, but it's one of those, be careful of what you wish for because now he's gotta run again in a truncated period of time in the runoff in June. The other thing that we, we, we focused on heavily in the book and we came to understand quickly in our research was Governor Christie and his role. It, it's inextricable. As much as Solomon Dweck is the leading character in this story, Chris Christie is a close second as in the supporting role. And that's because un, unrelated to his campaign, although some Democrats believe you can't say it's unrelated to his campaign, but unrelated to his campaign. In 2006, Chris Christie at that time was the very, very popular corruption busting U.S. attorney. And as soon as, and it was up to him as the manager of the federal prosecutor's office to decide whether or not Solomon Dweck would be allowed to turn state's evidence, would be allowed to become an informant working for the feds and to go out and to get any bad guys political corrupt bad guys or, or, or money laundering rabbis, it was Christie's decision. And this is not a figurehead kind of position, U.S. Attorney. It is a mechanical position. It is a management position. It is every single day. It is every single decision. If you look at the complaints in this case, like every other case, you will see they are all signed by the United States Attorney. It is his name on the line. He greenlighted this investigation. And as we go through and as we learn, spending a considerable amount of time with him and with his deputies in this case. He was not happy with Solomon Dweck. He was not happy with this case. He didn't trust Solomon Dweck. I mean, how could you? Solomon <laughs> Dweck is clearly you know, one of the greatest con men ever. And at that time, Christie, having access to secret FBI files, knew exactly how good a con man he was. And Christie figured, you know what? He conned them, he's gonna con me. And as we've all found, Chris Christie does not like perceiving himself to have been con. So, Chris Christie plays a critical role. We also had to come back to the Chris Christie element of the story because regardless of your politics or your view of the politics, this case broke chronologically in the middle of the 2009 race for governor. A race, by the way, that we only learned was as close inside, it was viewed as close as where the governor at the time, Governor Corzine, Hoboken's own. We only learned in our, in our reporting how worried he was about this campaign, about Chris Christie. It was, it was eye-opening. In fact, we've been asked what are the most eye-opening parts of the book for us, for the reporting process, the research process. For me as a political reporter, the most eye-opening thing was to learn how very, very scared John Corzine was of Chris Christie, of really any Republican running that year. We also embarked on research trying to get to the bottom of what happened with Joe Doria. Again, I mean, there's so much of the story that is focused on, on Hudson County. Joe Doria is a critical statewide political element of the political side of this case. But 
Joe Doria was mayor of Bayonne for, I, I think, three terms. It may have only been two. He also was a state senator and a state assemblyman from here in Hudson County, and he was at the time the community affairs commissioner in Governor Corzine's cabinet. As community affairs commissioner, he had a critical role here in the governance of the city of Hoboken because of the financial monitorship that the city has been under. And so, uh, you know, it's been said that state law makes the community affairs commissioner in a monitored town, makes the community affairs commissioner the mayor of the town, pretty much. And so Joe Dory was essentially the de facto mayor, or CFO, I should say, of the city of Hoboken at this time. Joe Doria also had the, was in the uncomfortable position of having his office and his home raided by the FBI on the morning of July 23rd, 2009. It was something that um, he found to be offensive and unwarranted. It was something that uh, Governor Corzine's top political advisors felt was beyond the pale, but also something that could not be recovered from for Doria, and Doria's career would need to be ended that morning, and it was. And it was something that has become very controversial because to this day, even though there have been more people who have been arrested and been charged in connection with the Solomon Dweck case, Joe Doria to this day remains uncharged, unaccused, but living under a cloud. And if we, were, if we, if we had his lawyer here right now, he would go into a tirade for just you know, bringing up the issue. So we, we embarked on a process to try to understand what it was that was happening with Dorian. Why did the feds believe he might be guilty? Or why did they have, why, how did they have the reasonable suspicion grounds to go and convince a federal judge that his office at home should be searched that morning? I mean, you can't just walk in, despite what we all think about the feds, there still is a judge involved in a search warrant process and they had to have a showing you know, behind closed doors to a federal judge that they believe that they have reasonable suspicion that Joe Dory has committed a crime and that a search warrant is warranted. And to this day, Joe Doria doesn't know what's, what's in that motion to the judge. The feds have never shown him. Uh, we've never seen it either. So if any of you has, has gotten your hands on it, please, you know, there's a copy outside. We <laughs> at the funk chili pot. I'd like to also end with an excerpt. And the excerpt that I've chosen has to do with what had been a, a secret piece of the case, we lay out that the series of arrests that were to be uh, effected on the morning of July 23rd, 2009, had been set in stone. That armed assault was marked on a calendar, albeit a secret calendar, but it was a calendar at the FBI, at the Justice Department. There was, however, one possibility for a reason to stop, to stop it in its tracks. The feds had long wanted to get to a developer in Union City named Michael Altman. He has since pleaded guilty to money laundering. Altman had always advertised that he had access to politicians who were on the take. Most importantly, Alvy Osiris, your congressman who for years was an assemblyman and mayor of West New York. And Altman had advertised to Dweck that he had given bribes to Albio and that he would continue to give bribes to Albio. Which, by the way, one of the most hilarious pieces of the book is when, I, when we confront Albio with that information and Albio has a pretty colorful response that, you know, we're not going to repeat it a library. Um, <laughs> not all of it was in English. And, well, that's right. It, it, and, and it was very, very loud. For those of you, Albio is one of those guys who doesn't need to be loud because he's really, really big and imposing even when he's quiet, but he was pretty pissed off. Um, so the feds wanted Altman. They wanted to get to him and make him do what Dweck had already done voluntarily, which is flip, become a cooperating federal witness. Whether he'd go out and, and get more people on tape is a different matter, but make him cooperate. If they could score Altman, if they could get him to roll over and agree to cooperate, Washington, you know, the FBI and Justice Department headquarters have been notified this thing would stop. And at this point, we, we might well not even know about this case because it's unknown where Altman would have taken them. It's unknown what would have happened. In the end, Altman does not cooperate. So, with Altman unwilling to deal, it was a go for the July 23rd takedown. 
The FBI's commanders were notified, as was the U.S. Attorney's Office in Newark. First things first, however, get to Dweck. Solomon was home and deal with his wife and kids, waiting to learn the results of the Altman move. With a call from his FBI handlers, Dweck knew it was red alert and that he needed to start the process of letting Pearl, his wife, in on the cascading secrets that had overtaken his life. The arrests would begin in 12 hours. Before the couple could share the moment of great confession, they needed to get out of the house. The feds wanted Dweck and his family nowhere near their ranch and deal as the assault occurred. Safety was the most obvious concern and everyone in the Syrian community knew where the family lived. Also, the Dweck family home is maybe 50 feet off of a public street and the feds had no interest in dealing with the press that would quickly converge. We're going away for a couple of days, Solomon told Pearl. Get the kids packed. As hard as it is to believe now, Dweck confided later that his wife put up no resistance to the news of the surprising summer vacation. The women of the Syrian community were typically compliant with the orders of their husbands, and Pearl did what she was told. Plus, it was the summertime, the kids weren't in school, a couple of days away would be okay, she figured. The family quickly left the shore and headed north to a North Jersey hotel, often used by the FBI to stash witnesses who needed to stay local but had to be kept out of sight. Solomon continued in his dual informant role through the night as the setups for the Pals and money launderers were finalized. At the same time, the FBI began its invasion of the New Jersey and New York area. The Dwecks spent that night and the following day at the hotel in North Jersey serving as an FBI safe house. Solomon's arrest in 2006 had shaken his wife badly. She also knew he was in bankruptcy. The bankruptcy, in fact, was Solomon's cover as he left the house every day while working with the FBI. All Pearl ever knew of the past three years was that her husband was leaving for a day of working with the bankruptcy trustee to unravel and sell off his assets. Or perhaps he was meeting with his attorneys on the bank fraud. For three years, as Solomon played the central role in an international sting, Pearl knew nothing. The next morning, July 23rd, Dweck finally told his wife. She was furious. Quote, it was much worse than any way you could put it, was all he would say later. She took the kids and left. Pearl and the kids now live in the Baltimore area. Solomon is somewhere around here, probably in a hotel or a location that the FBI uses to keep secret witnesses secret when they need them nearby. We, however, are here and glad to take your questions. <laughs> Connie, there was recently a story broke about him meeting with Dweck, along with a fellow by the name of Pichon, who later died after yes. the going on his stay. Both Pachon and Shaw were political operatives who were found dead alone, grown men, in their own homes under mysterious circumstances. I don't know if autopsies were done or not, but that's a, a sidebar to the story. But tell us about Devalier and his connection to the two men and what you may know about what's going to happen with him. Because apparently he got $20,000 from, from the left, half of which was supposed to go to Pachon. But as of today, uh, Devalier is still in his position and walking free. Ted wants to answer that question also. <laughs> <laughs> we broke the Demolier story. Demolier story is in the book. So um, you're absolutely right. The only thing is that for anybody who does care to know about the autopsy question, you should buy the Jersey Sting. You should read it all the way to the end, and your questions will be answered. <laughs> um, and if you don't want to read all the way to the end, you should still buy it, and then I'll tell you. <laughs> the, it, it, there's, we don't know the answer. And frankly, the county executive, from what I'm reading, the, the great work of our, of our colleagues at the, at the Reporter and the Patch and the Jersey Journal, it doesn't seem that uh, Executive DeGees has been all that verbose in answering these questions. Yes, Bud Demolier, for those of you who don't know, is a senior, member of the senior staff, senior administration in Hudson County government. He also was the campaign manager for DeGees and Healy. And Healy and Sal Vega in West New York. Demolier, another one whose privacy we invaded recklessly <laughs> um, by getting tapes that showed him in conversations agreeing to take money and talking about money he had already taken, which is a distinction from Councilman Russo. Let's, right, let's underscore this. At no point was there a reference to it being his lunch hour. Apparently that was his excuse. He, the money, of, the conversations with Dweck talking about development approvals and which lawyers to hire to get your project moved and making calls to the chief of staff in Bayonne. All this was done in his county office 
in his conference room, closed door. He later says, oh, but it was during my lunch hour, so it's okay. <laughs> I don't know. I can't envision my bosses at the New York Post saying that I should go deal drugs during my lunch hour in their conference room, but be that as it may. Um, he has not been fired. Apparently, Mayor Vega has run away from him as quickly as Mayor Vega can run. Hudson County is that nobody takes Bud's phone calls anymore. I don't know if that's true. Uh, it took a while for people to start taking Joe Doria's phone calls after the, after the raids. We don't know the answer. I'm, I'm being glib, and I probably shouldn't be glib because it is, it is somebody's livelihood. The truth is, we don't understand. He, it looks very, very much like Bud Demolier did exactly what other people in the Jersey Sting did, people who have since gone to jail. He did not, he's never been arrested, his name was never revealed until we revealed it for him, and he has never given back the money, which is, by the way, tax money, because every time the feds pay somebody off in a sting, they're using our hard-earned tax dollars. But I don't know, I mean, if you, do you have any more information? You seem like you're involved. Oh, in, involved. No, we, we not, not, not that, I'm saying in politics. We don't really know. We don't really know. Ted's been, Ted's been accused of um, asking what's going on with Demolier only as a means of selling more books. And is there truth that the other guy who was reading was directly supposed to get half of that money? He was getting a cut. I don't know if it was gonna be half, um, but apparently Frischon and Demolier have been in business before not in a, an illegitimate way, let me say that. In a legitimate way, Demolier has a private consulting firm called Dub Inc., which is B-U-D, Bud, spelled backwards. And he's properly reported Dub Inc. on his financial disclosure forms, and he and Frischon were in business uh, together. We will say that we, as I said, the coming attraction is we do talk about the two mysterious deaths.